You can start. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, wherever you are at this moment. My name is Radha Barwa. I am a part of the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime, and it is my honor to welcome you to this OC24 panel on a very uh, topical issue of environmental organized crime. Uh, I request all at attendees to use the Q&A feature to post your questions, which will be addressed in the last 15 minutes following all the presentations. Um, our panelists today will present their research undertaken in diverse regions from Eastern and Southern Africa to China and Russia, discussing various trends and issues such as the con con convergence of wildlife crime with other transnational illicit economies, the main issues and dynamics of illicit, illicit natural resource economies, the role of transnational criminal organizations in these economies, and criminal law versus environmental direct action in democratic societies. Uh, without further ado, I'm pleased to invite our first speaker, Alistair Nelson, who's a senior analyst at the Global Initiative and the managing director of Conservation Synergies. Alistair has over 25 years of experience leading conservation programs in the Horn of Africa, East and Southern Africa, and has several pub publications on the topic. Today, Alistair will present on the convergence of wildlife crime and other forms of transnational organized crime in the East and Southern Africa. Alistair. Good morning, or well, morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Thank you very much. Thanks, Radha. Thanks for the introduction. All right, let me um, share my screen. So, there we go. Um, so, as Radha said, I'll be um, presenting on some work we did on, on crime convergence looking at the illegal wildlife trade uh, and its links with other illicit economies. Sorry, is that, can you all hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, good. Um, so looking at links between IWT and other illicit economies in, in Southern Africa, East and Southern Africa, and looking at case studies and then some analysis of that and then some recommendations. Um, let me just get, there we go. So our research was conducted under an INL funded, so US Department of State funded grant uh, with the, uh, through the Global Initiative uh, from January 2021 to, to August 2022. We did 105 interviews across 10 countries initially, and those 10 countries are, are highlighted on, on that map in Eastern Southern Africa. And those interviews included with uh, law enforcement officers who worked on uh, illegal wildlife trade and in wildlife crime units and, and intelligence investigation units, as well as law enforcement officers who worked in uh, in, in um, addressing drugs, crime, human trafficking, etc., NGOs. And then a colleague of mine, uh, had uh, we had less formal interviews with people actually involved in, in some of the illicit economies as well. After that, we delved into five detailed case studies, which I'll highlight here. And those are in the sort of redder colored um, countries. So Uganda, we looked at a case study between Malawi and Mozambique in South Africa and in Madagascar as well. Key things that we we found and some of this sort of that, that um, well, actually, that underpinned how we analyzed the work was that obviously crime, we know that crime convergence occurs where criminal relationships have, have matured. We found that corruption and illicit financial flows were, were ubiquitous. So we didn't actually consider a link between corruption and illicit financial flow as convergence so that we just those things have to happen for organized crime to, to occur um so both of them so we didn't actually look at illicit financial flows as as uh, convergence we looked for another form of of convergence within, within an illicit economy we found that most convergence occurs further along the value chain. So in what we were looking at, the illicit wildlife trade, the illegal wildlife trade, we, we found that that more, is more associated with trafficking than with the poaching and the killing and the extraction of the, of the illegal product. There are important exceptions to this, and I'll, I'll highlight these. Um, and we also found that the illicit wildlife trade networks were less vertically integrated than other organized crime types, again, with, with one, one important exception. 
And so what that means is that we found them much more a series of interlinked businesses operating, moving a product from one place to another, each one with their um, skill at either finding the product, um, poaching or extracting the product, trafficking it, um, uh, and then selling it, whatever it might have been, but much, much less vertically integrated, as I said, except with one, one important exception. So in doing this work, we, we actually ended up uh, with our own functional classification of, of convergence. And, and that's the, a copy of the report cover, which came out in, in, in April this year. So the first is we basically classified um, convergence as network convergence. Network convergence is when we saw the same organized criminal networks trading in multiple com commodities. We class the, other, the second um, functional classification we use was hub convergence, where we see multiple commodities from different networks passing through a transport hub or another bottleneck, often with the support of a corrupt facilitator. And then later, we came across something that we defined as broker convergence. And this is when we were actually looking for illicit products and, and convergence in a, in a couple of places. And we found that when we spoke with the local brokers involved in illicit economies, they could source multiple illicit products for various from various criminal economies. So if we were talking to somebody who knew how to get heroin, um, and we started asking them about wildlife products, they were able to um, access wildlife products or gold or whatever it might have been. So they knew how to how to get into those networks, basically, and find products locally. And this is typically so that's typically lower in the criminal value chain. That's sort of a source area. So typically in a capital city or in, a, in an important city close to where those the, the, the goods are being um, are coming from or that they're transiting through or where there's a local market, for example, like heroin. Um, so overall, we found less network convergence than expected, um, which was surprising for us because there's a lot in the press about sort of network convergence with the illicit wildlife trade in particular. But we found that hub and broker convergence was pervasive. Everywhere we looked for it, we, we found it. In network convergence, I'll just go into our case studies. Um, I'll go into the Abalone in a separate slide afterwards. So Abalone in, in South Africa and the convergence on the, the trade there from the poaching, the, the trafficking across to, um, to Asia. Um, first, a few more words on the illegal wildlife trade in the heroin economy. So this is one that um, has occurred. We hear about a lot. Uh, and it's something that obviously the, the east coast of, of Africa down all the way down to the, the southeast is a major heroin trafficking route from the Makran coast um, from coming out of Afghanistan, Pakistan, and through Pakistan and Iran, down to the East Coast, into South Africa, some for those local markets, but then to be trafficked onward from there. And that's an old um, trade route. So that's heroin is being move, moved on dows that have been traf trading products on that route, licit and illicit for, for hundreds of years now, and is very interlinked with the ivory trade going all the way back to the 1800s as well. So we expected there to be more linkages here um, than we found. Um, and I guess it's particularly because I, uh, the, the wildlife products are moving offshore there and the heroin is moving onshore. And we did find there are a few cases where, where the networks are sort of involved, but it's not entrenched. And we found it to be a, a lot less convergence at the network level there than, than we expected. And we looked hard for it. Um, this, the third one that we was poaching networks in southern in South Africa. So our two main um, the, the exceptions that we found to a lot of our ex overall sort of our, our generalizations were in South Africa, which has a very long-standing and entrenched um, criminal criminal economy. And here we found that the poaching networks are often involved in other types of violent crime, cash and transit heists, kidnapping, um, um, assassinations, and when poaching becomes more challenging, we see them switching um, between these different crime types, basically. So a few words on, on Abalone in South Africa and the network convergence. This, uh, this was particularly interesting, and Abalone has been around for a long time, the Abalone trafficking. So what we found is that the source networks where the poaching occurs, mostly in the Western Cape and the Southern Cape, so the very bottom of South Africa, we found that there's convergence between drugs and violence extortion. So the the local gangs are often very involved in, in buying or sometimes actually running the poachers that, that um, go out and collect abalone, but they're also involved in, in, in the drugs and violent extortion criminal economies as well. The trafficking networks then get involved in, in both drugs and violence. So what we find is that there's normally these um, 
quite entrenched Asian networks based in South Africa that are trafficking the uh, um, abalone across to Hong Kong. And they are often involved in either the distribution of drugs in South Africa. Sometimes more recently, it seems the importation of drugs have so cocaine coming in from Brazil, as well as in the violence economy as well. So that could be assassinations um, and violent extortion as well. And here we found an integration of licit and illicit economies, and particularly linked to value exchanges. So there's Asian networks bringing in sometimes um, chemicals, which would uh, legally, which then are become the precursors for uh, drugs that are manufactured, synthetic drugs that are manufactured in South Africa. They get involved in that manufacturing and then do a value exchange of those drugs with the uh, drugs gangs in the Western Cape that are supplying the abalone. And, and we had an example of a, a of a drug exchange that was basically, a, actually it wasn't um, synthetic, but it was, an, it was cocaine that had been imported and was exchanged for a, a volume of abalone um, on the road between Cape Town and Johannesburg. And here, as an exception, we see very strong vertically integrated control where those Asian networks are very aware of how much abalone is coming in from different places. And so it becomes very hard for law enforcement to penetrate these networks um, with um, buying operations uh, because they know how much should be coming in from different places. Um, hub convergence, we found, we looked at um, airports in Mozambique, Maputo, Nampula, and Pemba. And everywhere we looked there, we were able to find that a corrupt facilitator, often a police officer, um, but sometimes an agriculture control officer who you went to, whether you wanted to move um, cash to Dubai or gold um, or um, illicit wildlife or sometimes drugs, um, you're traveling drugs, there was somebody that you could go to and they would help you through that airport. And relatively easily, we were actually able to get a hold of the phone numbers of a lot of these people. We saw the same thing at Avato Airport and at the seaport, Majunga Seaport in Madagascar, which is an important route, um, sea route from Madagascar across to East Africa. And in, in these places as well, like in Mahajanga, we found the same facilitator where if you were trafficking um, or, or um, sorry, supporting the movements of people from who wanted to move from Madagascar to the Comoros to get to, May, to the French island of Mayotte, um, you use the same facilitator in Mahajanga, um, the same, it was actually a private sector facilitator there. It was a, um, somebody who was involved in the, um, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, so like, uh, getting goods and dealing with your taxes when you when you when you move goods ship goods that same person would help with whether you're moving people to the Comoros whether you were moving cannabis across to uh to East Africa or whether you were moving um high value illicit tortoises live tortoises from Mahajanga to Comoros and then on to East Africa and then they get flown to Southeast Asia and the same at, at, in South Africa, actually, this was more speculative. This wasn't something that we looked at, but, but just by chance, we came across as well, again, a private sector packing company that was involved in, and we came across it through, through Abalone, basically, there was an Abalone delivery going there. And then there, it was clear that uh, drugs were being packaged in the same place, Rhino Horn was being packaged in the same place, and that was being shipped out of Oliver Tambo Airport in Johannesburg in, in South Africa. Um, and we also came across something else where um, where at the inspection point for passenger baggage, it was possible to pay a small bribe, a relatively small bribe, really, to move um, drugs goods through um, through that airport. Um, and so um, we weren't able to follow up on interviews on that. But in discussions with other law enforcement officers, it seems that Rhino Horn moves exactly the same way through with the same low low level bribes. And the, and the the low value of that bribe suggests that there's a high quantity of goods moving through that scanner. And looking at convergence, the broker convergence, um, in northern Mozambique, we were looking at land body parts. We know there's a land body part market coming out of the um, Nyasa, Nyasa Reserve in, in um, northern Mozambique and going across to Malawi, which used to be a major transiting hub for illicit wildlife um, products going to Asia. And we went to, to look at this and we found that there is still trafficking of land body parts across to Malawi. And there are also gemstone trafficking coming out of the same reserve. There's artisanal mining in, in um, Nyasa Reserve, that, and those gems get taken to Malawi and then certified as Malawian gems before they are exported. And that uh, th there we found it's often it's the brokers. It's the people who come in and they say they want to buy the line products. They go to the artisanal miners. 
and there's this overlap between the brokers basically and what's got linked into that is the use of pesticides for poisoning carcasses for killing lions as well so these pesticides are brought in from as poisons from malawi and then that's linked all through these brokers who basically do the buying and selling of these goods and transport it back to malawi um, I'd spoken earlier about RWT in the heroin economy, where we didn't find it very strongly in the networks, but we did definitely find it linked at the broker level. So whenever we looked for either illicit wildlife or we were talking to a broker about illicit wildlife um, products or about heroin, they were able to source the other one um, or knew how to source it as well. And then we found an interesting overlap, actually, and it sort of comes up a bit as convergent between IWT and the recruitment to violent extremism in in Nyasa Reserve. So with that Islamic insurgency in northern Mozambique, one of the things we found was that um, this link between the law enforcement action that had been taken in Nyasa Reserve and the recruitment of those people. So we found that um, people have been involved in ivory poaching, had then, when ivory poaching was clamped down on in Nyasa Reserve, they moved to artisanal mining. And the law enforcement strategies used to address the, the illegal artisanal mining, which were to destroy camps, to burn camps, to take away people's goods. And they were quite humiliating in, in how that happened. And people felt, and, and the link to the local corruption by local district government officers, which meant that local people feel, felt they had no, and particularly young men, felt they had no opportunity whatsoever because the money that there for economic development was being misappropriated. They then turned and um, and were recruited by this Al Shabab, that, which it's it's not linked obviously to Al Shabab in Somalia. It's the local Al Shabab, just meaning the youth, um, and they joined that Al Shabab insurgency in in northern Mozambique. Um, so we tied this work into some some broader work we've been doing over the last um, the last couple of years, mapping the illicit flows in this region. I'm um, given time. I'm not actually going to get into that much, but because all this does really is just show the impact that that um, insurgency really has had on um, on the illicit flows, where we used to see a lot of goods landing into northern Mozambique and Musumba the Praia, where um, the insurgency was based for a while. And here we can see by 2021 that everything misses this area in northern Mozambique. All the illicit flows have now started to go around it. You know, you can see these goods coming down from Dar es Salaam. And some drugs were, we used to come on those as well, and, and goods evading tax. Um, and now you can see how they completely move all the way around. So you just see this big hole here that this insurgency brought in. Um, all right. So um, actually, I'm not going to go through through this given time. Um, I'm just going to go to the end where the recommendations that came out of our interviews as well. So having spoken to 105 different people, we went back to a lot of people, particularly the law enforcement officers after this um, study, and we spoke to them like, what would you do? What are, what are some of the things we should be doing to address this? And the first is deepen our understanding of the wildlife crime from a wildlife crime perspective of the value chain, basically. Where are the key points on the chain that we can have the maximum impact? Where can we target our actions? At the moment, a lot of effort is going into targeting poachers who are, and as I've shown, are very much at the lower end. Um, and it's not where a lot of convergence is happening, except in key places in South Africa. Um, the wildlife crime units and, and intelligence investigations units have had the most impact. And that comes from another piece of work that we've done um, over the last few years. So where we've seen um, major changes in wildlife crime in countries in Southern and East Africa, it's where these targeted units addressing the organized crime nature of wildlife crime have been based and have been successful. The key to them though is building their resilience, resilience to corruption and being penetrated, but also around leadership and sustainability as well, because they often work when a good leader is put in place and supported, but we need to look at that, how we can develop those um, uh, systems for over the longer term. We need to continue strengthening the criminal justice system, particularly focused on local governance. So it's not only about criminal justice system to address wildlife crime, but it's actually to put in place a functioning criminal justice system at quite a local level so that there's a more structured and ordered society as well. And where there is support being given to local courts and local areas and local governance improving, we've actually seen declines in wildlife crime specifically. Proactive court monitoring has a role to play. And that's been extremely successful in addressing some of these more difficult organized crime, organized wildlife crime cases. And there's a quite a few cases that we documented on this. And that could be both passive, where people are just um, sitting and recording what's going on and understanding how the cases are playing out and then putting in place capacity building activities or impacting on or, or even um, 
giving input into, into how legislation can be strengthened in the future, but also active. So there's been cases, for example, in Malawi, where ambassadors have been present in court when, we, when they've known um, that there's corrupt activity happening, and it makes it impossible for the magistrate um, to, to actually um, to come up with something that's, that's, that, that doesn't follow the law, basically. And there's recordings where um, a broker for the the organized criminal was speaking to somebody with a link to the magistrate and saying, basically, we can't do anything. There's too much, too much um, focus on this case. From clearly from this work, we need to target the corrupt facilitators. Hub convergence, we found hub convergence everywhere, and that's all being driven by corrupt facilitators. And we need to target them and the money launderers. And if you know, we can just use that 80-20 rule. Um, 20% of the people are doing 80% of the bad stuff. We need to target those 20% of those people. Um, informal networks between law enforcement and criminal justice systems worked best. So um, that was from another study we found when looking at transnational organized crime, it wasn't by putting in place these MOUs and high level agreements between countries that organized crime groups got broken. It was when there were trusted relationships between law enforcement officers at a local level, and then they used MLAs to exchange evidentiary material, et cetera. But the key thing is those informal networks across borders, um, for law enforcement across borders. Um, and then the formal systems for transnational cooperation can be built on top of those. So rather, instead of putting in place these clever agreements, let's rather follow the work where law enforcement officers are talking to each other, where they want to build cases, that's where we need to put in place the formal systems. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Um, thank you, Alistair, for your presentation. Uh, we remind attendee attendees to put their questions in the Q&A box and the best panelists will respond to you in the final 15 minutes of the webinar. Um, our next speaker is Andre Ar Aranega, who is an independent researcher grad who graduated from the Institute of the Pontifical Catholic University of Rio de Janeiro. Andrew has published several academic publications focusing on various areas from international security and geopolitics to illicit trade and organized crime. Today, he will present on transnational organized crime and environmental crimes, categories, dynamics, and consequences to state and non-human communities. Andre. Perfect, thank you. I'm just gonna share my screen for a moment. Second, with my screen is frozen. I don't know why my screen has frozen. Do you want to stop and share again, maybe? That Even my mouse bad, stop responding for a second. I don't know what's happening here. Mm -hmm. It's the definition of Murphy's Law. I will stop your part, your sharing, so you can try again. Please do it. Everything is frozen. I don't know why, but maybe can we move on to Andre Anisimov and then I'll try to work this okay. issue out? Okay. Um, oh. thank you. Oh, sorry, um, Andre. I will just quickly introduce you. Uh, while we wait for um, Andre Aranega to sort out the issue, we will invite Andre Ani Sima, who's an assistant professor of the Department of Criminal Procedure and Forensic Science at the Irkutsk branch of the All Russian State University of Justice. Before, uh, sorry, before. 
Before Andre became a professor, he was working at the Ministry of Internal Affairs of Russia from 20, 2002 to 2019. And today, Andre will present his research titled Silent China's Mafia Invasion to the East Siberian Region, region Issues, Lack, and Local Enforcement Opportunities. Thank you, Andre. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate by this uh, inviting, and I try to share my presentation. Okay. 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 Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, let's start. Uh, uh, some tradition. Uh, Siberia at all, and uh, especially East Siberia region, traditionally was marked as uh, one of uh, Chinese interests. Uh, it explains by historical and economical ways. So on the one hand, uh, the East Siberia lay near the Silk Road, which was the famous, for example, uh, which was uh, the famous trading and logistic way from China to Europe. There traditionally were many hunters, smugglers, merchants, out migrants. Line between legal and illegal activity was very thin in all times. On the other, on the other hand, East Siberia is a rich region. In this area, fur trappers, gold, silver, lead miners, and other were usual. In this territory, we were forced to labor camps a lot. So that's why criminal rates uh, there is traditionally higher than in other regions of Russia. Nowadays, Irkutsk Oblast is the center of the uh, East uh, Siberia region. Uh, on this territory, settled those of extractive industries. Um, uh, some of them are abandoned, but officially, a part of them you can buy or rent. Criminals use uh, this situation for timber, coal, gold, and jade illegal exporting. Uh, separately, uh, Issue is an illicit tourism industry of Chinese people. In some places, you can see, in fact, uh, Chinese possession, uh, possession villages, hotels, lands uh, uh, that let out to Chinese tourists or workers with uh, false legal formalization and uh, tax avoiding. Of course, uh, straight uh, illegal property use or resource export uh, are impossible due to Russian legislation. Uh, this kind of illegal activity requires hiding financial and intelligence sources. Uh, Russian criminals commit this kind of crime uh, alone not so often. That's why uh, in this activity, a uh, few Russian citizens play uh, with a uh, Chinese mafia together. Uh, some of these criminal schemes were solved, but most of them are still working. Uh, main offender in this criminal business, of course, uh, Chinese citizens, uh, but uh, they tend to escape law enforcement attention. Uh, there are lots of uh, reasons uh, of it. Uh, for the last few days, I above mentioned scenes uh, looks like a silent foreign invasion, which uh, widespread con uh, consequences uh, as a huge, uh, no, like the, like a huge deforestation, local climate changes, water and soil uh, pollution, uh, black uh, markets uh, dawn or rising. Uh, indigenous unemployment uh, growth uh, are, are most typical of uh, these issues. Uh, I will try to describe, uh, to describe our main problems uh, with, uh, with it. I will show uh, uh, some crime commitment schemes and propose some ways to solve it. Uh, we have studied uh, police reports, uh, operative reviews on the subject, interviewed operatives who directly deal with uh, law enforcement duties in these fields. We also studied uh, media reports and uh, interviewed uh, indigenous uh, groups, but just a few. We have to admit uh, that unfortunately we based on a lack of official statistic data, uh, at least uh, um, relevant uh, statistic data. Uh, as a result, we noticed uh, uh, a tip and an iceberg of uh, its issue and may describe uh, typical features of uh, Chinese illegal activity in our region. So, what if you look uh, at the core of the Chinese illegal activity? In the beginning, uh, we should pay attention to how illegal system of financial operations uh, which uh, living in uh, East Siberia Chinese uh, citizens deal with uh, is designed. Uh, in big cities of region, Chinese firms are opened officially. Uh, these outfits do service in typical fields like uh, Chinese markets, hotels, recreation centers, cafes, restaurants, and other. Many of mentioned uh, outfits are opened with a criminal activity goal too. Uh, firstly, uh, these substantial uh, outfits are created with money laundering goal, but uh, it's uh, hidden under legal activity. 
Uh, as per operative reports, uh, we may claim that up to 18, 18, 18 <laughs> percent of uh, declared earning of uh, it, uh, it is uh, laundered money. Uh, secondly, uh, in these places, uh, illegal activity uh, provides uh, in uh, Chinese people to Chinese people format. Uh, there are several popular types of it. For example, uh, gambling, sex trade, unlicensed health uh, healthcare service, uh, law service, uh, employment uh, intermediary, and uh, credit accommodation. Uh, it's uh, more often. Uh, it's uh, quite interesting to figure out uh, how the gray money transactions uh, between Chinese people, including credit accommodation, are working. Uh, for example, uh, money transactions are, are provided by uh, hard money payments, uh, including uh, local money exchange, which, uh, with uh, special uh, receipt uh, creating. Uh, you may present or surrender for payments uh, it's, uh, in any another similar Chinese places. Uh, which exists in the Russia and uh, get your cash money back. Uh, that's uh, how great Chinese banking system appears and works in Russia. In the same way, Chinese people to Chinese people uh, and other services in Irkutsk Oblast are provided. For example, uh, healthcare service, uh, it includes uh, full bodied uh, hospitals with uh, outpatient observation, simple surgical facilities, uh, childbirth assistance, and other. Uh, these places include uh, common uh, medical equipment and uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, often of uh, suspicious origin and uh, illicit for trade in Russia. Uh, next sample uh, is uh, touristic and uh, logistic service, which uh, includes uh, all inclusive medical insurance and, uh, insurance and other. Another one is a telephone and internet providing. It works on commercial base uh, for in format Chinese to Chinese people, but uh, with avoiding of official Russian providers' uh, tariffs. Uh, all in all, uh, there are full-bodied uh, full uh, hubs of base uh, illegal infrastructure are designed. Uh, Chinese people for Chinese people, where uh, they can loan and spend the money, take basic social services without any kind of official Russian society integration uh, and uh, Russian language usage. Uh, due to above-mentioned illegal system, of financial operations, the same activity uh, stays behind Russian legislation and fi financial monitoring. How it's possible? Uh, the terms of uh, Chinese illegal activity lay in behavioral uh, features fields. Uh, it connects with uh, cultural aspects and uh, Russian legislation and law enforcement practice lacks and drawbacks uh, either. Uh, firstly, uh, Chinese culture is substantial, substantial, different than Russia or any kind of European or American. I mean, uh, South and North American, both. Uh, Chinese citizens who arrived uh, to our region uh, have significant problems uh, with adaptation and assimilation due to cultural borders. In addition, Chinese society and uh, government uh, not welcome this kind of assimilation. As a result of it, uh, excessive requirements uh, for illegal service uh, appears uh, because uh, legal uh, Russian services are hard to receive um, freely, for example. Secondly, uh, Russian education and social integration programs for foreign students uh, are developed very, very slightly. Uh, official arriving Chinese students uh, are usually live in is isolated groups without uh, widespread connections with uh, Russian native speaker, students, and uh, when study ends, they usually back home without friendship or relationship uh, in Russia. Thirdly, uh, although uh, existing uh, Chinese-Russian borders uh, is complicated for official crossing, uh, crossing uh, there is an uh, alternative uh, modus operandi for Chinese people who once arrived in Russia was illegal. Uh, there was, uh, uh, through post-Soviet uh, countries, especially Kazakhstan, uh, arriving in Kazakhstan from China uh, is much easier uh, than uh, in Russia from China. If you came to Kazakhstan and made local documents, your way to Russia will be quite uh, simple, uh, thanks to uh, Eurasian, uh, Eurasian uh, Economic Union Convention uh, between Russia and Kazakhstan. This uh, supplies a uh, stable flow of uh, illegal Chinese immigrants uh, to Russia and uh, our region. Uh, this flow is estimated approximately in tens of uh, thousands of people per year. 
It overflows uh, official uh, count of China's uh, migrants in several times. Uh, fourthly, uh, integration between Russia and China's uh, law enforcement is weak. Uh, for example, Irkutsk Oblast Police, uh, uh, police uh, submits uh, over 1,000 requests annual uh, as per Interpol coordination. Uh, Irkutsk police uh, haven't been receiving any official response from Chinese police during uh, at least 10 years. Uh, Uh, but uh, at least hundreds of the same of it from Europe. European speakers and cultural bill. Uh, in addition, this type of working is impossible due to Chinese uh, clanship, main difference and uh, totally non acquaintance uh, acquaintance of Chinese language uh, among Russian operatives. Uh, in what connection uh, all above uh, mentioned with environmental crimes uh, in Isabira and Arkutsk Oblast? Uh, as our research shows, uh, uh, crimes related with illegal uh, natural resources extraction in East Siberia and Arkutsk Oblast for local Chinese mafia are not more than the way to earn illegal money for another more sufficient project developing. In fact, uh, all common condition, uh, conditions for uh, its illegal activity was created and uh, local law enforcement uh, haven't uh, anything uh, to oppose to it. Uh, there are illegal habitation, medical care, money laundering and money laundering and other systems. At the same way, law enforcement are poor inquired about this illegal activity or uh, haven't sufficient resources and equipment or aren't mind to overlook it's in uh, exchange for reward. Uh, the schemes of China's uh, mafia environment uh, crimes commitment are typical. Activity field re related with the uh, environment uh, is uh, chosen by a criminal uh, ad hoc. Uh, it may be logging, coal or gold mining, jade extraction or any other kind of activity. It depends uh, on goals of uh, criminal groups, existing opportunities uh, or local authority corruption. Uh, after that, uh, they find a Russian citizen uh, partner who directly set up an uh, entity and uh, make uh, required documents. Uh, it's uh, substantial uh, reliefs, uh, legal body registration, uh, tax payments, and staff employment. Uh, as uh, partner role uh, are playing uh, fictive or real wives, uh, real uh, or fictive uh, Chinese wives, uh, Russian wives. Uh, Criminal-related uh, Russian uh, business partners, including enrolled by Chinese mafia during, during uh, China visiting or business making, uh, Russian citizens. Sometimes uh, homeless uh, people play this role, uh, role too. Uh, more often than not, uh, this activity is started for illegal extracting natural uh, resources uh, legislation, for example, timber, coal, gold, jade, etc., without continuous uh, sending for selling. Uh, in Russia, uh, immediate, uh, immediate, immediate uh, illegal activity in the vast majority of cases is made by indigenous. Uh, this scheme typically uh, includes uh, the counter uh, agents uh, network, one day companies, for example, using uh, machination, ma machinations with uh, financial and other taxes reports, uh, cash withdrawal, uh, money laundering uh, in above mentioned centers and other. Uh, so, what we're able to do? Uh, we need uh, to start uh, criminological uh, regional resources of Chinese mafia. We have to recognize that nowadays is a blind spot for us. Uh, it's not uh, just all about uh, statistics, but uh, anthropological uh, researches, uh, which, for example, uh, Dina Ziegel haven't been doing for years in Europe. Uh, Chinese uh, migrant programs for legal arriving and assimilation in Russia and society developing is required. Uh, is required. Of course, <clears throat> we are able to develop these programs with Chinese government partnership of on federal Russian authority level. We have to create with uh, Russia and Chinese partnership a plan of law enforcement or action for Chinese criminal activity, including Interpol data exchange and maybe creating some special departments in the Russian law enforcement structure. Thank you for your attention.
Uh, thank you, thank you very much. I ended. Thank you, Andre, for your very interesting presentation. Um, we're a little bit short on time, so I'm just going to bring back um, Andre Aranega, um, who has joined us again. And uh, let's see if it's working now, Andre. Oh, sorry. Yeah, exactly. Andre, do you want to share your screen and see if it's working? Hello again, everyone. I'm really sorry for this minor technical mistake. I'm going to try to share my screen again. Just a second. You should be seeing my screen. And I I believe everything is going to be fine right now. Just a second. Um, I just quickly want to remind speakers to stick to the time as much as possible so that we can get everyone in and also do some Q&A. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. So good evening, everyone. I'm sorry once again for this minor technical mistake. My name is Andrea Aranega, and I'm delighted to return in this new edition of the 24-hour conference to discuss some of the topics explored in my master's thesis in international relations, which focus in, on issues related to transnational organized crime and environmental crimes. As you can see in this image, it is evident that environmental crimes, much like other types of cross-border illicit markets, are a significant part of the global illicit economy that deserves further attention, whether due to its organized and transnational nature or the seriousness uh, of its impacts on our world. So basically, drawing from scientific papers, academic books, institutional reports, and news articles, this presentation offers a concise, a concise uh, overview of these topics, divided into three parts. First, we begin exploring the major categories of transnational environmental crimes in order to take a deep dive into its network dynamics and global patterns of illicit environmental flows between the global south and north. In conclusion, this presentation highlights the profound and potentially irreversible effects of transnational environmental crimes on states and humans and non-human communities. First and foremost, it is crucial to know that even though there is no single definition for organized crime or transnational organized crime and various theoretical frameworks to study this phenomena, much of the literature describes them as respectively criminal enterprises and the illicit counterparts of multinationals. So basically, accordingly, these entities are primarily driven by power and profit, participated in various illicit markets throughout the world, and usually with very distinct organizational structures. But by chance, environmental offenses emerge as a distinguished modality of an illicit market in this context, similar to the previous concepts. Whereas there are several legal frameworks and no universal definition of environmental crime and transnational environmental crime, some definitions hint at some of its most relevant characteristics. They are terms referring to illegal acts that harm the environment or that breach national and international environmental laws, the deliberate evasion of environmental laws and regulations by individuals and companies in the pursuit of personal financial benefit, the cross-border trading of species, resource, waste, or pollutants in violations of prohibition or regulatory regimes established by multilateral environmental agreements or in contravention of national law. Or more generally, they are forms of transnational crimes where criminal entrepreneurs enjoy opportunities to gain substantial profits by plundering and destroying the Earth's flora and fauna. As for its major categories, illicit logging and timber trafficking, illicit mining and trafficking precious metals, wildlife trafficking and poaching, illegal, unregulated and unreported fishing, waste disposal and trafficking, and the illegal trade in ozone depleting substances stand as the most famous and well-documented forms of transnational environmental crimes. All of the previous environmental offenses have very specific drivers. For example, differences between price and cost arise when expected profits from illegal trade surpass legal trade, when demand for legal products outstrips supply, and when regulations can be by bypassed with illicit methods. Additionally, there are situations where regulations meant to correct market flaws or protect the public don't achieve their intended goals. While there are also instances where law enforcement agencies fail to effectively, effectively enforce the law and protect citizens. But of course, this should come as no surprise, given that we are dealing with offenses that share notable similarities with other forms of transnational criminal activity. 
First, as our world has grown more interconnected in recent decades due to the modern effects of globalization, criminal groups and networks engaged into environmental crimes have expanded their transnational reach. These organizations exhibit business-like traits, providing illegal goods and services to fulfill specific demands. They consist of a diverse mix of state and non-state actors, all collaborating at each stage of different illicit environmental supply chains, which are highly characterized by their network dynamics that frequently bridge very specific geographic locations abundant in natural resources right in the global south to wealthier city, cities of the global north. And of course, these offenses are also closely linked to converging crimes like drugs and arms trafficking, money laundering, extortion, corruption, fraud, and even biopiracy. Having discussed their key drivers and the similarities with other forms of transnational criminal activity, we should redirect our attention to the activities and actors involved in each stage of illicit environmental supply chains, especially if one wishes to really grasp the global picture of transnational environmental crimes. In the initial stages, primarily in the global south source zones, activities such as poaching, life capture, cutting off trees, fishing, mineral extraction, and waste disposal are carried out by distinct players like poachers, loggers, fishermen, prospectors, legitimate enterprises, disposers, armed groups, and even corrupt local officers. In transit zones, spanning both Global South and occasionally Global North countries, activities like carving, tanning, document fraud, bribery, concealment, smuggling, and even money laundering take place, involving manufacturers, designers, smugglers, brokers, even shipping companies, custom agencies, fraudsters, financiers, and corrupt border officials. And finally, in consumer zones, primarily in the global north, there is the consumption, purchase, or use of illicit environmental uh, products with market controllers, vendors, traditional medicine practitioners, wildlife restaurant owners, consumers, and entertainers fulfilling their demand. Now, as you all might expect, Beyond regional and local trends, which are very valuable, it is essential to recognize the global patterns of illicit environmental flows that link various regions of the world. In the Asia-Pacific region, Southeast Asia stands as a global supplier of illicit logging due to global timber and palm oil demand, with Indonesia, Myanmar, and Malaysia as key source countries, for example. Additionally, in this region, with countries like China, Vietnam, Thailand, Malaysia and India, they all play a, a pivotal role in wildlife trafficking, driven by demands for traditional medicines, exotic pets, and luxury items. Of course, the first two of these countries being consumer countries and the, and the latter source countries. And furthermore, in the case of waste disposal and trafficking, China, India, Bangladesh, and Vietnam are all key source countries. Meanwhile, much of the African continent, especially South Africa, Tanzania, Kenya, and Nigeria, for instance, serves as a primary source for wildlife trafficking. Countries like the Democratic Republic of Congo, Gabon, and Cameroon, with their vast rainforests, are major hubs for illicit logging, while the mineral wealth of Angola, the Central African Republic, Congo, Liberia, Ghana, and even Sierra Leone, for instance, has made them strategic sources for illicit mining. In West Africa, Country examples such as Nigeria, Ghana, and the Ivory Coast is a significant destination for the illegal dumping of electronic waste from developed nations. But in Europe, on the other hand, with countries like the Balkans, Spain, and Italy, they act as both a destination and transit hub for wildlife trafficking. In countries uh, in Europe, they also ex import a substantial amount of illegal trade, I'm sorry, illegal timber, from Southeast Asia and the Amazon forest, even though there are significant sources for illegal timber within the Eurasia region, such as Russia. But in European countries, it is important to highlight that they also illegally import illegal minerals from many parts of Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America. Last, last but not least, it is important to mention that Mediterranean countries are major sources of illegal fishing, while Germany, the UK, and Italy are notable sources of waste disposal and trafficking. Furthermore, similar to Europe, North America serves not only as a major source for the illegal export of electronic waste 
to developing nations, Brussels as a destination and present hub for wildlife and in their trafficking, especially from Southeast Asia and South America, as well as for precious minerals. And at last, Latin America and the Caribbean stands as, foc as focal points for illicit logging, illicit mining, and illicit fishing, wildlife trafficking, driven by global demands, especially in the Amazon forest. But in conclusion, the global picture of transnational environmental crime is often clear, except for waste disposal and trafficking, consumer countries for the majority of transnational environmental crimes are largely located in the global north, where a source country are mostly present in the global south, and transit countries take on alternative shapes depending on the case. In other words, in most cases, the global north usually acquires timber, animals, plants, fish, and minerals from the global south, while in return, the biodiversity and resources of the latter are essentially exchanged for waste from the former. Finally, in wrapping up this presentation, it is crucial to underscore the severe repercussions of transnational environmental crimes, especially considering their capacity to literally destroy our planet's ecosystems and eliminate the necessary conditions for human and non-human existence. Illegal fishing, for example, reduces fish stocks and state income, impacts the livelihood of indigenous and local communities relying on fishing. It jeopardizes legitimate business, marine ecosystems, local fishermen safety, sustainable fish consumption, fishing management, and increases the risks of driving exotic species to extinction. Illicit logging, on the other hand, destroys global forests and biodiversity, diminishes carbon sequestration potential, disrupts the hydrological cycle, encroaches on indigenous people's land, increases global temperatures, air pollution, and deforestation levels, displace local communities living in forest areas, and reduces state revenues from countries reliance, relying on legal timber trade. As for wildlife trafficking, we can certainly understand that it damages ecosystems, biodiversity, and habitats, leads to the loss of exotic species, spread disease, introduces invasive species to unfamiliar habitats, and even erodes cultural and spiritual values tied to wildlife and shared by local communities. Illicit mining increases water, land, and air pollution and deforestation. It intensifies soil erosion, reduces oxygen levels, exposes human and non-human communities to toxic chemicals. It undermines legal mining operations and even increases the risks of extinguishing various plants and animal species. The illegal waste sector amplifies greenhouse gas emissions. It scales the number of unauthorized landfills and storage areas, releases more black carbon and pollutants, increases air, land, and marine pollution, spread diseases and health risks, and contaminates soil and groundwater. And at last, in the case of the illegal trade of uh, ozone-depleting substance, it is important to highlight that they destroy the ozone molecules, increases the vulnerability to solar ultraviolet radiation and health risks. They damage marine organisms and plants and even disrupt climate patterns and crops. Well, though this presentation offered just a snapshot of the primary categories, dynamics and impacts of transnational environmental crimes, I hope you found it informative and indeed alarming as it should be. If, if the global community aims to navigate the challenges of our near future, especially as climate change and transnational organized crime continue to reshape our surroundings and daily lives mutually, we need increased academic focus, political and corporate accountability, civil engagement, and financial investment to address these issues. Thank you very much once again for your attention. And if you have any questions or thoughts on the topics covered, I am eager to discuss them during our Q&A session. Thank you so much, Andre. Um, for our last speaker, we have uh, Junesu Hang. He's a lecturer at Sung Kong Ho University. 
and his presentation will address the trends in criminalizing environmental direct actions in democratic uh, societies. And he will discuss to what extent civil disobedience organized by environmental campaigners should be accepted as self-defense. Uh, Junseo, please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh... I know we are running short on time, so I'll try to uh, go through my presentation very briefly. So uh, again, my presentation title is about uh, crimes uh, that are committed in the name of nature. So we are now witnessing uh, different types of environmental direct actions in uh, democratic societies, but uh, in parallel, we are also witnessing governments are moving towards the criminalization and policing those kind of actions uh, in a more uh, violent and uh, in a more violent way. So my question uh, based on these kind of observation was, to what extent can we uh, justify these kind of environmental directions and why do we why do we have to accept them or why do we have to uh, why do we, why should we uh, not accept some kinds of environmental directions? Right. So uh, my, so I will go through, uh, first, uh, the definition of that environmental directions will be provided, and then I'll move on to overview what kind of legal reactions have been taken to uh, different kinds of environmental directions. And then finally, I'll try to propose uh, kind of this law that can protect or sometimes regulate socially acceptable environmental directions. Right, so uh, basically in this presentation, I will define environmental directions as disruptive activities that are motivated by environmental campaigners, uh, basically based for environmental goals, uh, values, to raise uh, public awareness sometimes, to protect the environment, or sometimes directly stop policies that may be harmful to the planet. So. Ooh. So uh, usually when we talk about environmental crime, we tend to think about crimes against nature, but also there are crimes associated with the environment. And in this case, in my, my presentation deals with the latter. So uh, we, are, we are witnessing different uh, types of environmental direct actions. Uh, one of them is civil disobedience, uh, actions that usually refuse to obey certain laws but not the whole system, social system, but only certain laws or social orders. And civil implies non-violence. And in, similarly to civil disobedience, we have civil resistance, uh, usually that refer to uh, actions that challenge authority or regime. So this is more proactive than uh, civil disobedience uh, in terms of opposing to the government per se or the regime. And sometimes it can transform into uh, activities that may be associated with violence, kind of violence. Uh, so sometimes civil resistance uh, can overlap with um, eco-terrorism. And finally, uh, eco-sabotage uh, eco explicitly aims to destroy uh, facilities or uh, other infrastructure or sometimes uh, mobilize kind of violent actions to stop uh, activities that may be harmful to the environment. So we do have some uh, environmental organizations that use these kind of anti-sabotage ex tactics uh, in the global north. Uh, I'm not gonna spell them out uh, in this presentation, but uh, many of them are being uh, charged with criminal offenses against the property rights. And also some of them are actually listed as terrorist groups uh, in the United States and some other uh, other countries. So the question is, how how can we define, how can we draw a boundary line between different uh, different types of environmental direct actions? As we are witnessing the planetary crisis, uh, more and more environmental campaigners are being mobilized and also they use different tactics and repertoires. And then, uh, but still, the law hasn't been hasn't changed and has uh, failed to respond to uh, this to proportionately uh, different uh, types of environmental directions. Right. So you, we are looking at the map where uh, different uh, different uh, types of environmental justice movements have been uh, organized. So it's, it doesn't. It, this map is not exhaustive. 
but people have registered their uh, own stories and news about environmental conflicts in their countries and other societies. But there are they, these are a lot already, but we will see uh, we'll see an increasing trend in terms of more environmental direct actions and uh, movements. But then how can we? But how can uh, liberal democracies, especially, I'm not talking about like authoritarian regimes, but how can liberal democracies respond to these kind of social movements and dis disruptive activities? For now, uh, for now, liberal democracies like the UK government and the U United States and other uh, and Germany, those kind of uh, liberal democracies have responded to environmental movements which use uh, disruptive activities by criminalizing or enforcing the law against them. For example, Germany raided down a climate activist group for their violent actions against the property rights and also public uh, security. And the UK government is going to propose a new bill that uh, that grants the police to stop, directly stop uh, strikes or uh, civil gatherings if they are being uh, violent and disruptive. But the criteria for being disruptive uh, is vested within the police. So that there are going, uh, there are debates going on about whether liberal democracies are being authoritarian in terms of uh, dealing with disruptive activities organized by environmental campaigners. So then why uh, environmental direct actions are being organized and why they are using this, this kind of disruptive activities Basically, there is a logic that we are living in a state of emergency. So like, for example, climate emergency, planetary crisis. So while the planet is collapsing, environmental campaigners uh, believe that this should be justified. Their activities should be justified to raise public awareness and also expose loopholes in our social system, which fail to uh, deal with uh, deal with the planetary emergency. So that's why uh, they try to uh, try to uh, disobey with the law sometimes uh, because they believe the law actually serves capital and uh, the powerful of the society who actually benefit from the ecological collapse. So some environmental theorists and campaigners even see liberal democracies are very slow, ineffective, and sometimes very skewed to the powerful of the society. Um, so that's why uh, they believe uh, environmental direct actions are necessary to protect nature. And so that's why uh, they believe their actions are justifiable. So criminal charges should not be imposed on themselves, but rather criminal law should be revised to uh, charge criminal offenses against those who destroy the environment. But uh, sadly, uh, liberal democracies have not been responded responsive to those kind of claims. So now we will uh, we are now witnessing more social conflicts between environmental campaigners and the national governments, even in liberal democracies. So uh, I will uh, briefly overview what kind of legal reactions have been taken to uh, different types of environmental direct actions. So basically, uh, those who are in favor of environmental direct actions do not see these kind of activities as crime. So they believe this is kind of a self-protection, self-defense of our life, home and family in a matter of urgency. So they tend to emphasize the right to life, environmental rights, uh, etc. So their value is, uh, is imposed more emphasized on planet and life per se. Rather, uh, in parallel, those who are against environmental regulations tend to emphasize public order and property rights. So they believe uh, even if uh, activities that are non-violent, uh, if they, uh, if they uh, are against property rights, that should be uh, criminal, that should be criminal offenses. So we do have different uh, types of environmental uh, direct actions, as I said. Uh, but there are, so mainly eco-sabotage and armed resistance have been criminalized uh, already. But now we are witnessing protest and disruptive activities are also being criminalized. And we are, so that's how I see liberal democracies are being authoritarian. Uh, well, I am running out of time, I think, so I will go quickly. 
So we are you're looking at the pictures of different uh, environment activists who have taken, um, for example, like sit and protest and also squatting, etc. But some of them, even if they are uh, trying to be peaceful, some of them uh, have been targeted uh, by police violence. Uh, for example, Manuel Taran, uh, he is allegedly, he had a gun while he was trying to protect the trees, but there is no evidence, hard evidence that uh, the, the, the police had to kill him uh, uh, in the US. Okay, so I'll just move on to my final uh, stage. So what kind of environmental direct actions should be socially accepted uh, on what criteria? I think this uh, question would uh, raise more debates and this public discussions in upcoming uh, upcoming years. So I propose uh, social meanings of uh, environmental direct actions can be aware awareness, raising public voices, and also sometimes it can uh, it is just to be of legal challenges. And it is a part of social uh, political activism, so it should be protected as a as a free expression of political rights, civil and political rights. And then finally, it's a, it also takes a part in social protection by imposing pressure on groups that commit environmentally destructive uh, activities. So, by when we look at these kind of meanings of environmental directions, we have a good rationale for protecting these kind of environmental activities. So then. Uh, uh, so in contrast to the existing uh, legal action, reactions taken by uh, national governments in liberal democracies to environmental campaigners, we can prioritize, uh, if we prioritize sustainability over property, then more, uh, more and more environmental directions can be justified uh, as free expressions of civil rights rather than being criminalized. So this means this shows that liberal democracies have, uh, while they have emphasized like sustainable development or sustainability per se, but their criminal uh, criminal law has not responded uh, properly to sustainability. So they are not ready to uh, enforce sustainability. So for them to for liberal democracies to enforce sustainability, they will have to uh, be more open to different environmental directions. But uh, of course, there may be a limitation. For example, like we cannot uh, obviously cannot allow uh, uh, armed armed conflict or armed resistance uh, in liberal democracies. So I think I'm out of time. So I have some more points to uh, deal with. But I can I hope I can uh, talk more about these points in the Q and A time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Junsu, uh, Junsio. Um, do we have any questions uh, from the attendees? Uh, please put them on the Q and A bar. But if not, we would. I would request Andre to take on the first question in detail. Uh, what is the role of Chinese organized crime in illegal timber trafficking in Siberia, and does this illegal timber make it to Europe and North America, Andre? Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, this role uh, is. Uh quite big, uh, maybe huge. Uh, uh, I, um, uh, talk, uh, I, uh, <laughs> I spoke about it uh, one year ago. Uh, it was a scandal uh, several years ago with the IKEA. Uh, they uh, bought uh, some uh, wood from Indonesia, FSC certified, uh, but uh, 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 it was recognized that uh, this uh, wood uh, directly from Siberia, from our region, uh, at, uh, it was recognized that it was illegal. And uh, that's why uh, it was bought in Indonesia and uh, it was uh, received from the China. Uh, of course, uh, it was uh, uh, laundered uh, wood, no doubt. Uh, I ask... Uh, <laughs> from your from this uh, from this question, am I asked? Sorry, Andre. Um, thank you so much for your response. If there is any follow up questions for Andre, um, please do type it. We do not have um, any more questions yet from the attendees, so. Would the panelists have any questions? We have five minutes left, six actually, for for the other for the other panelists. 
No. Okay, um, Junseo, do you want to quickly address the last points just in the, in you know, that you had to rush over and we can close the session. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, right, so thank you very much for other panelists uh, which have, who have uh, presented very good work. Uh, so my final point uh, before, we, before we finish this session, my final point will be that uh, liberal democracies, we're, we're now witnessing uh, international criminal law. Uh, it's changing. For example, we are, uh, so there is a global movement to criminalize the ecocide as a serious environment destruction. Um, so if these kind of, uh, and also the European Union is changing its uh, directive on environmental crime, we're in a more proactive way to uh, include ecocide in its own uh, criminal uh, crime directive. So if this environmental crime uh, has been actually neglected in many ways in many uh, countries criminal law, but if environmental environmental crime uh, is can be more punished harshly, then uh, environmental direct actions can be justified as uh, self-defense or self-policing. So far, uh, liberal democracies, like uh, especially Western countries and also Asian countries, I'm speaking from South, South Korea. So these kind of countries, uh, while they uh, tend to emphasize sustainability in the global politics, but actually at the national level, their criminal law has, uh, has been very strict and harsh against environmental campaigners. So uh, while discussions on environmental crime tend to focus on environment criminal uh, criminal offenses against nature, we also have to think about like uh, crimes that are associated with the environment, uh, because that way, uh, because as as long as we cannot uh, protect our civil rights uh, to protect the environment, it, uh, it's quite difficult to uh, enforce the law to protect the environment uh, in general. Thank you very much, Junseo. Um, anyone else? We have three minutes. I want to um, say well, many sorry. thanks, uh, many thanks uh, for organization for its conference. It's, uh, it's a huge opportunity for us uh, due to some uh, political issues, economical issues, and other and other. Uh, I just uh, want uh, to uh, show uh, some uh, kind of uh, our problems in our region and uh, to uh, pay attention to uh, of uh, international community for our problems. Thank you. Okay. Can I so respond to that? I was really interested to hear Andre's presentation and the similarities between the um, immigration of people from China in particular into Eastern Siberia is so similar to what we've seen over the last 20 years in countries in Africa. And that, that arrival of people in, in uh, formal and informal ways, um, and then the link into the licit economy initially, and, and then sometimes how that moves into the illicit economy as well, and those closed networks that are very hard to penetrate and understand. Um, and, and work with particularly for local authorities it was really the similarities were incredible to see so thanks for your presentation Andrew. well i think this presentation was extremely informative as we um grapple with the concept of what is environmental organized crime and i think there's a long way to go or maybe not um, till we really, really catch the real perpetrators, the one who are causing the damage to our environments, whoever they may be. And I feel that our experts have a lot more uh, information. So please feel free to find them online and contact them uh, if it helps your work. Um, with that, uh, I will close this um, session as we're one, one minute away. And thank you. Thank you so much, all participants, for this extremely insightful and topical uh, 